go ahead and look in the book of Acts because there's um, some things that we need to really look at. And no matter how many times we've heard something, if you are hearing a subject being taught or anything and you think, oh, I've already heard this or I already know this or I'm bored with the subject, that means you need to check your heart and get yourself ready because God wants to teach you something. <laughs> and the devil's trying to keep you with a bad attitude so, he, so you don't learn the very vital thing that God wants you to know about now in this season of our lives. Amen? So just to go over real quick, in the book of Acts chapter 1, that talk, that's about when Jesus told the disciples to wait for the gift of God, which he was speaking about the Holy Spirit, and not to leave until the, um, the Holy Spirit came. And, um, so, and then in chapter 2, it shows on the day of Pentecost, it starts with the day of Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit came and um, uh, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And they were accused of being drunk, and um, Peter got up to preach. The one that had actually denied Christ um, the, the night of the Last Supper, or during that night next morning when they took him to crucify him. But now, after he got filled with the Holy Ghost, he stood up with great boldness and power and began to preach a message. He was the very first preacher... <laughs> Uh, anointed preacher in the in the in the church, Amen. And so he got up and he preached, and um, he preached about in the last days that God said He's going to pour out His Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. So even on my servants, both men and women, he said, that's what separates the Old Testament, the end times, from the earlier times was that he said, even on your servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And so we know quite well that there is no difference in the New Testament speaking spiritually of gender. You're, there's male and female, but God looks upon the spirit in the heart of man. Amen. So anyway, then, then Peter goes on to preach and boy, he gave them a licking. He whooped them up one side and down the other, explaining to them about what they did and how they crucified the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. And then in, in chapter 2, verse 37, and when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, as they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, they could see that there was something strange going on with these apostles. Amen. They said, brothers, what? What shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. He was setting out the, the, the blueprint for the church. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. And it's still to this day that what must we do we must repent, which means turn around from your sin. Doesn't mean keep living in your sin and live in the way you've always lived. Repent, turn around from your sin, amen, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. There must be repentance of your sin for the forgiveness of your sin, right? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So I love it that he said that they have to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And so then, then after th that day they had, you know, uh, they had turned around and turned their lives to God and um, they had their first glorious revival and thousands got saved, right? So, and then daily, they, were, they had fellowship one with another. They were coming together and sharing meals and just, you know, how we all do. You know, Christians are good at food. We got it. Got that down. But, so they were believing and people were being added to their number daily. People were being Christians. We're talking about revival was going on. So then in chapter 3, it talks about Peter and John were going, this is uh, chapter 3, verse 1. 
Um, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at uh, the time of prayer at three in the mo afternoon. And now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate, beautiful, where he was put, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention. He gave them his attention. I'm going to turn this fan off. Hallelujah. That's what you got to do when you're in church. You got to give your attention. And a lot of people flail in their walk with God and in, in, in their growth with the things of God because they don't pay attention, but he gave them attention, expecting to get something. That's what we have to do. We come to church, we pay attention because we're expecting to get something that's going to change everything. Amen? And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus. Now see, Peter was all about the name of Jesus. He said they got to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Now he's, he's speaking to this man about being healed. He said, in the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. <laughs> if you couldn't walk, for, for 40 years, you'd be excited and you'd be walking and jumping, right? Now, let me just say what happened here. This was a miracle. If we can understand what a miracle is, the difference between healings and a miracle. A miracle, people, God can heal somebody in the course of time. You know, doctors can't really take credit for healing anybody because God made the human body to actually regenerate itself to some degree. And so, but God will also speed up that process. Or if somebody's sick and that process isn't working in their body, their immune system, God can fix that immune system. There's many ways that God will heal. He can, you know, just in the name of Jesus, you know, laying hands on the sick, you know, believing by faith in God's word. There's many ways. And we got to stay open to God and how he wants to do things at that particular time. Amen. So, but a miracle is something, and this is where people think, you know, you're either believing God or you believe in science. Let me just say this so we get it clear once and for all. God made science. God created the natural realm. He spoke the earth and everything in it and the universe and the stars and the moon and the sky Everything he spoke into existence. He created nature. He created and made science. So if you believe in God, you believe in science. <laughs> However, a major point with a Christian, I believe in God and I believe in science, but I ser serve a supernatural God. Science is natural. It's just what nature... Science is just how the natural world and nature works. Science, how a person gets pregnant, that's science. DNA, that's just science. God created the natural world and therefore he created science. Amen. Amen. But God is a supernatural God, and he can at any time supernatural a situation. That's called a miracle. It's when the divine power of God clashes into nature, <laughs> and something changes that nature can't do. Amen? So we are supernatural children of a supernatural God. And so when Peter came in contact with this lame gentleman and he took him by the hand and in the name of Jesus, he got up and walked. 
Amen. But he didn't walk, just walk. He was jumping and he was, he was skipping and a hopping and a singing and a dancing. Amen. So in verse 11, while the man held on to Peter and John, all, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Now, let me just say, he's talking to the people that were around just months before when Jesus went around doing miracles and healing all that were oppressed to the devil. These were the same people that he had fed, uh, that, that Jesus had multiplied the fishes and the loaves and that people that were getting healed and blind eyes were being opened and all the miracles, signs and wonders and, on, the, and the, on what they celebrate is Palm Sunday is when Jesus came into Jerusalem, amen, and they all flocked to see Jesus. So if we can just understand that they, the disciples weren't talking to them about somebody that they, they didn't know or hear about. They saw it in the tabloids, <laughs> the newspaper, the fake news even covered it. <laughs> so he says, why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness that we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed? And you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You, dis you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murder be released to you. You killed the author of life. How do you like that? <laughs> now, this is Peter preaching to people to get them born again. We are living in the weirdest society where so I've never seen so much mamsy pamsy in all of my life, as I see now, where people are so easily offended. People don't get, they say they don't get saved because Christians don't act the way they think they should. Well, then why aren't you acting the way you think a Christian should act? What a hypocrite. Because... Because you're not seeing an example, then be the example. But he was saying to them, why do you stare at us as if by our own power and godliness that we, we had made this man walk as if? This is, if, if we can just take a look at what was going on in the early church and what has faltered in today's church. Because people, God used Peter to do a miracle, a notable miracle, in front of all of these people. Now, if this would happen today, you'd have to get security for the preacher. And you'd have to get him a special kind of car and a super-duper airplane and keep him away from the masses. And take up a giant offering. And usher him in the back door where nobody can see him before he comes out. And then usher him out the back so nobody can come in contact with him. That's what got in the church. These men with great power that were doing miracles, signs, and wonders were out among the people. Amen? So, then he says, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see in and no, was made strong. It is in, it is Jesus' name. And the faith that comes through him, that has completely healed him, as you can see. They said, we're not taking any credit. I am, it's not because I've prayed many hours. I'm just saying, what's in the church? It's not because, oh, I pray so many hours and God shows me visions. This is what's in the church. We've got a 1,000 members. We've got 10,000 members. 
we got so many we can't count our members. And then you get around preachers and they're all, how many are you running? How many are you running? Why do you want to know? What does that have to do with anything? This is what got in the church. Comparisons, because somebody wants to feel better about themselves. Well, I've preached in front of thousands of people. So what? You ain't got nothing if you don't have Jesus. And if you ain't preaching Jesus, if you're preaching yourself, just give it a minute, you'll falter. Do we wonder why so many preachers are falling to the wayside, quitting ministry? So many preachers. Now, this is not a bag on preacher. We're talking about what got in to the church and what has to get out of the church. How the church started when Peter did miracles, signs, and wonders is don't look at us as if we did this. I'm neither taking the credit or the downfall. It's by Jesus' name and Jesus' name alone. Amen. Amen. And so, anyway, then he said, Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you have acted in ignorance. So, in other words, you, <laughs> you, you fools! Look what you did! But I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that this Messiah would suffer, repent then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. That is what has to happen in the church. We've got to live a life of repentance and, ha and ask God to help us and strengthen us to live as he would desire for us to, where he's our priority, not when we're in a jam and a pickle, but he's our priority in the good times and in the bad, the ups and the downs, the ins, the outs, that God is always priority number one. And what God wants for us and for our lives is priority number one. The church has gotten real loosey-goosey, greasy, whatever, because everybody, people are living as if I have all these plans and I just want God to bless them. I've been to some Bible studies. I've been to around where there's celebrities and stuff. And, and they just butter them on one side and butter them on the next and all try to tell them how, you know, oh, God wants to give you this career. You'll be rich and famous. I think I want to slap somebody. When are you going to prophesy to them that they need to repent in the name of Jesus and be baptized? Turn away from their own selfish desires and go to God and fall before God and repent. Instead of trying to make your way in Hollywood or wherever. It doesn't even matter if it's Hollywood. You could be in a company and want to be the CEO. It doesn't, none of it matters if it's not the plan of God for your life. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> the truth hurts, and it can sound real harsh. So, let's look at in chapter 4. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John and while they were speaking to the people, and they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming, in Jesus, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. They went to jail for preaching Jesus. And let me just say, we are in that hour again. The things that we saw in the book of Acts, we are going to begin to see those all over again. The only thing they're going to add to it is being beheaded because they, weren't, they went through great persecution. And we know by history the persecution they went through. That doesn't talk so much about it in the Word, but we know that they were, putting, they were putting Christians on top of giant sticks and lighting their bodies on fire for streetlights. They would line the city streets, 
with sticks and put Christians' bodies on the top and light them on fire for light at night. They were night lights. But we know that in the book of Revelations, it talks about in the very last times that Christians will be beheaded. Are you ready to be beheaded? You are not, people are like, oh, I'm ready to die for God. I'm ready to die for Jesus. You're not ready to die for Jesus if you can't live for him. You will bulk at the opportunity. So in verse 4, that was just extra. <laughs> they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. <clears throat> but many who heard the message believed. They heard a harsh message. They heard a tough message, and they believed. Uh, not no mamsy pamsy nightclub scene. I've seen things in church, and I'm talking churches that have thousands of people that were no, they were so disgustingly ungodly and people were applauding it. This has to be out of the church. Let me just say, every single one of those churches are closed right now. <laughs> They've all closed down. Amen? So, many who heard the message believe. So the number of the men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers and the elders, the teachers of the law, met in Jerusalem, and Annas, the high priest, was there. And so were Capias, John, Alexander, and others, other of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power? By what power? Or what name did you do this? They understood that there was some name behind the power in which they did these things. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There's absolutely no way to God but by Jesus, because Jesus is the door. He's the truth. He's the life. There's nobody like Jesus. I was thinking about that when we were worshiping God. I was thinking, Jesus, there's nobody and never will and never has been anybody that will be like you. Nobody like Jesus. He's everywhere by the Holy Spirit. He's He's never grows dim in power or comfort or provision or healing. He, and he never weakens in any of those areas. He exudes mercy and compassion. Yet listen to the way that Peter preached. Because there's that side to God too. Amen? There's no name in heaven or earth. In verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Can somebody tell that you've been with Jesus? Can people tell by the way you act and the way you talk that you spend time with Jesus? That you know him, you've been with him, you spend time with him. Do people know that just get around you for a few minutes and know that there's something different about you? You must be one of those, one of those other kind of Christians. Amen? But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading, to stop this thing from spreading, 
to stop this thing called Christianity, what we call today the church, to stop, to stop this thing from spreading. Any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. And that is what happened to the church. We stop this thing from spreading. I'm talking about the New Testament. Holy Ghost, tongue talking, blood redeemed, powerful, miracle working church to stop this power from moving forward. We must demand that they don't preach or teach or talk about the name of Jesus. And that is what got in the church. What got in the church is preachers no longer wanted to offend anybody because they'd rather have a crowd than have the power. You've got to make up your decision. It's your decision. Make up your mind. You need to contemplate. Do you want numbers? Do you want people to think you're all that? Or do you want the power? Because you can't have both. If you, I'm talking about wanting the fame that Hollywood had got in the church. People wanting fame and fortune. People preaching for money and for fame. Notoriety. Recognition. So they told them to stop, to stop talking about the name of Jesus. So people decided, well, we want to find out from sinners and baby Christians why they don't go to church. This is how, let me just say, this is how the user-friendly move, movement started. If you go to any of your unsaved family or friends and you go to Christians that are mad at the church or mad at their pastors or mad at God and you go to them and ask them, what kind of church should we have that would make it easier for you to go to church? You will have a church with no power. Because people that get offended constantly and that get offended and stay offended are going to be offended. Because the word itself is an offense to those that hear it and don't believe. If you want to make a person that's not saved come to church you're going to have to let them drink and sin and do everything and don't talk about the bible and don't talk about jesus and don't talk about the holy ghost and don't talk about the blood if you're going to get these people you can fill you can fill up a huge social it'll just nothing it'll be nothing but a social gathering because you'll have no power if you can't proclaim the name of jesus and boldly say whatever god tells you to say if you're more concerned about what people think. God even said in his word, if you're more concerned with what man thinks than what he thinks, you are not fit for service in the kingdom of God. All we got to care about is what does God say? What does God think? Amen. So in verse 18, he says, then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes. I love the boldness of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? Let me just say, we've got to learn how to honor the gift of God, which without glorifying a man and thinking that there's some, some spiritual thing. We are who we are, and God called us to be what he called us to be. But we're all the children of the living God. We're all a part of the body of Christ. And we all have got a job to do. And we can't take any glory for what God chooses to use us for. And we can't be ashamed of what God uses us for either. God needs all of us doing our part and knowing that we all have access to the name of Jesus the miracle working name of Jesus. All glory and honor and praise will always go to the name of Jesus. Amen. I, I really feel like there's, you know, there's power, power, wonder working power in the name.
in the name. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the wonderful, powerful, beautiful name of Jesus. There's always been, and there always will be. It'll never weaken any time or any day. We've got to remember who we are and who it is that we serve. Amen. We've got to remember morning, noon, and night that we can call on the name of Jesus. That's the thing that the disciples knew immediately. It's in the name of Jesus. Not us. It's the name of Jesus. Can we see how what happened in the last 30 years in the church, how it just got opened up to complacency and mediocrity and sin got in, Hollywood got in, ungodly music got in. Music became about the person singing it. Music became about people trying to get a career off of their, their talent that God had given them. These things have to change. There's going to be a whole other kind of music coming. But God's looking for clean vessels that will not take the glory as they have in the last few decades. God wants to raise the dead, but he's looking for a vessel that will not take the glory. Because when people take... I've been around for 40 years and I've seen every kind of televangelist big preacher, big church pastor, and I have seen them drop like flies because they tried to take the glory for what only God could do. God wants to use man and woman, boy and girl. People will fight about anything. We're not fighting about anything. We're just going to preach the name of Jesus. If they don't like it, that's between them and God. But as for us, we can't help it. <laughs> He's all we have. Amen. Amen. And he gave us the Holy Ghost and he said, be filled. To stay filled. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word, for your precious word, Father God, in that you are moving and wakening your church as in, in like no other time, Father that there's been so many mighty, precious moves of your spirit, different waves, different seasons, all about your word and about the infilling of your spirit and about healing, about who you are. But Father God, I thank you at this hour. You are shaking everything that can be shaken and that your people will arise and give you all the glory and the honor, give you all the praise, for it's only by your name, Jesus that we can be saved, and by the name of Jesus, that miracles will happen. In Jesus' precious name we pray. All those agreed said, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God.